my name is Ali with Inspired Classroom. And it is so, oh, there's Shoreline. Hello, Shoreline. <laughs> That's great. It is so nice to see you guys today here at beautiful Penrose Point State Park. Um, we are here with the Washington State Parks Foundation, and this program is brought to you by the Peach Foundation uh, with support from Polycom, GCI, VisionNet, um, and this phenomenal organization called Harbor Wild Watch. Who? I think she's out there. Oh, hey, here's my friend Sue. You guys see her out on the beach? She's coming up. Would you like to come and talk to our our scientist students today, Stina? I would love that. It's awesome. She's going to tell us a little bit about the creatures that you're going to find if, when you come and visit Penrose Point State Park in real life. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to Penrose. My name is Stina, and I'm a marine biologist from Montana, if you can believe that. So, are there any Montanans with us today? Not this group? I, we do actually. Oh, yep. oh there's one! <laughs> Hello, uh, so you can study biology and it can take you to really cool places. And this really cool place is one of my favorite beaches. And we're so excited to bring you and introduce you to some of the creatures that we find in what's called the intertidal zone. Now, here at Penrose, we have what's called an estuary. Now, when I first came to Washington, I thought I was visiting the ocean because when I tasted the water, it tasted salty. And can I see a thumbs up if you know that the ocean is salty? Yep, salty oceans for sure. But what I didn't realize is that the Puget Sound has over 10,000 rivers and streams, which is a lot of fresh water, mixing in with the salt water from the Pacific Ocean. And that mixture creates a special habitat called an estuary. And so that's what we're exploring here today. And what's even cooler is that as our Earth is rotating and the moon's rotating around the Earth and we're orbiting around the sun, we get this amazing thing called tides. And that's the water slashing back and forth in response to the gravitational pull from the sun and the moon. Now, we won't get too much into that, but just knowing that today we're here on an fabulous low tide. So the water is being pulled off the beach and out. And you can see that behind me and maybe watch as that water slowly moves away from us. Now, when the water is out on a low tide, that gives us the chance to explore the beach without snorkel gear and scuba gear. And let me tell you, this water is cold. I'm wondering, can I see with your hands? Can you guess? Uh, maybe a like, do you think it's 20 degrees? Do you think it's 100 degrees? How, how, what temperature do you think the water is out here behind me? Let me see some, some numbers. 10 degrees? 30 degrees? I see some 50s. That's about right. On a warm, warm day, <laughs> the Puget Sound can get up to about 55 degrees, which if you go swimming in that, Ooh, let me tell you, that is cold. Which means that the animals that are out on the beach are sometimes covered in this cold water. And then when the tide goes out, they're exposed to the heat of the sun, to the dryness of the air. And the struggle is real in this zone between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide. And that's our inner tidal zone that we're gonna be exploring today. Now, here with Harbor Wild Watch, we love taking people to the beach, especially virtually. How cool is that? And when we're at the beach, we like to remind people to be a guest. Because as much as I wish I lived here at the beach, I don't have the right adaptations or skills to survive that cold water. I need a thick layer of blubber to stay warm. Um, I need to learn how to eat, um, maybe catch crabs with that. I don't know. It just wouldn't work out so well. So thankfully, we're adapted to this nice land environment. And um, so when I visit the beach, I remind people that we're a guest and that we're guest, those letters can keep, um, can remind us some important things to keep in mind. So the first letter G can remind us to gently touch those creatures. Um, we want to be really careful with them because some of them are fragile and we don't want to poke them. We don't want to prod them. You wouldn't want to be poked or pried off of your home. Um, so same thing with those creatures. We want to treat them really gently, and especially if we can, pet them with a wet 
finger because we don't want them to dry out while they're out here roasting in the sunshine today. And so we're gently touching those animals. That you is to remind us to use our head, which is always a good thing to do. Um, everybody, take your hands and feel, how big is that head of yours? Right, kind of nice size there. This will remind us what size rock is safe for us to flip. A lot of animals like to scuttle under rocks and hide when the tide goes out. That's gonna help them stay cool. And so to see those animals, you have to flip those rocks to check them out. Now if I flipped a huge rock, number one, I could crush my toes. That would be unfortunate. Number two, I'm not gonna be able to gently place that rock back because our second or third letter in the word guest is E and that's everything stays. And that's probably one of our most important reminders because if I flip that rock over to check out what's living underneath, I need to make sure that I put it back. The seaweed on top of that rock, if it gets stuck in the mud, it's not gonna be able to use the energy from the sun to make its food and grow. No, and so by flipping that rock back over, I'm protecting the things that live on top of the rock, as well as the things that live under the rock. And so including that, <laughs> included in that everything stays, we're also making sure that the animals we find stay in the particular habitat where we find them. Because the inner tidal zone, it's broken into sections, kind of like neighborhoods. There's the high part of the beach that's exposed the longest, it has the most sun and the most air as that water goes away, and that's called the high intertidal zone. There's the mid intertidal zone, which is kind of the medium place where a little bit of water out, a little bit of water in, and then there's the low intertidal zone, which is where animals without shells that they can only stand a couple of hours out of the water um, before they would dry up and die. So they live nice and low where they're mostly covered by water for the majority of the time. So um, everything stays where we find them in those areas, um, including those fun, fancy shells that you may find, the pretty rocks. Um, it's all part of this ecosystem and it should stay there so that we can keep that nice balance and keep those creatures that we're visiting nice and happy. Now, the next letter in that word guest is an S and that reminds us to step lightly. We don't want to go running down the beach, number one, because it's a slippery place out there. There's mud, there's seaweed, and if you slime and slip, <gasps> You could cut yourself up with some of the sharp shells of the creatures that live there on the beach. They have no mercy. Oh my goodness. So we want to step lightly for our safety as well as for the creature's safety. You don't want to squash a snail or step on a sand dollar. And plus, if you're running, you're going to miss the life that covers this entire area. So stepping lightly will help us to slow down and appreciate all the amazing animals that call the inner tidal zone home. Now that last we just had a fast join. <laughs> Perfect. Welcome. Uh, we're going over our, our good beach manners. And the last uh, thing for us to remember is for us to take our belongings. Because we, we want to leave this place probably even better than we found it. If there's trash on the beach, we can pick it up. And of course, not be responsible for leaving it there in the first place. And remembering our sunglasses is important and our coats and whatever we may bring to the beach. We want to keep that all with us. Now with that, I think we're, we're about ready to explore the fabulous intertidal zone. But let me tell you one thing. We're going to have a mystery creatures. So as we go through each zone, I'm going to give you a clue. And that clue, or all three clues, will help you guess what this mystery creature I have is. And I'll introduce it to you at the end. Hey, you guys are so awesome. We're having just one little issue where we're, I think we're kind of um, showing up funny for some of the classes. We're going to disconnect for like two seconds and then be right back. So I want to see if while we're gone, you can brainstorm as many different sea creatures that you might find at Penrose Point State Park and then we'll come back and you guys can show us on your hand how many you were able to brainstorm. On your marks, get set, go! Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, how many creatures did you guys come up with in brainstorm? Show us on your hands. One, two, oh, 30. A lot. Awesome. Well, let's, let's go meet some of those creatures. And we'll start again in the high. Oh, here we go. Right at the top of the beach. Okay, you're great. All right, another class. zone because they have a hard shell. Now, I'm going to take a moment and we're going to imagine the life of a barnacle. So you have to think that, okay, I'm a little creature and when I'm first hatched, I have three days to find a hard spot to live. And what's interesting is I have a super glue spot on the top of my head and I need to stick that somewhere. Whether it's a rock like this one, maybe a shell or a dock, possibly a boat. And when you find that place, you're going to stick your head onto that rock and build a shell around your body. Um, that shell is a lot like a little, a little volcano, and then you have a special little trapdoor on top to help close up when the tide goes out, and you can stay nice and wet inside that nice shell. Now, it looks like a couple of our barnacles are hungry, which is perfect. Give it a thumbs up if you can see the little barnacles sticking out this interesting kind of eyelash looking thing. All right, maybe. Okay, cool. And so what's happening is because that barnacle is stuck on its head, it uses its feet to eat. And so those are actually its feet scooping through the water, trying to catch little pieces of plankton that, that it can then eat from in between its toes. Um, can you imagine trying to eat like a barnacle? Or if everyone in the cafeteria was doing headstands and eating their lunch with their feet? My goodness, that would be strange. Now, sometimes these barnacles, because space is limited, they have to grow up rather than out. So this is an example of some barnacles that are like the skyscrapers of barnacles, where they would be stuck to a rock in a tight quarters, uh, growing, growing this nice tall shell. Um, and that's going to help them be able to reach the food that they need to get. So we're going to swap cameras because I'm going to show you there's another species of barnacle that gets almost the size of a six inch Subway sandwich. Um, and it's the giant Pacific barnacle. Swapping cameras over here. Yep, yeah, sorry. Maybe. There we go. Hello again. So this uh, barnacle I have here, you'll notice it's not alive anymore. It doesn't have that trap door that would seal the water inside the shell. Um, instead, it's hollowed out, kind of like a volcano. And so I know this barnacle, it's, it's not alive anymore. Just the shell is left behind. But you can see how huge this barnacle gets. Um, now this can actually be a delicious meal for people. Um, some people will eat these big barnacles. It's not quite worth it to eat the teeny tiny ones because that's a lot of work. But this big barnacle um, is just like the tiny ones, only only bigger and it can scoop through the water and catch food with its little uh, food catching toes and eat it out from between its feet as well. Um, raise your hand if you think you'd enjoy eating a barnacle for lunch. Could be interesting. Awesome. So. Uh, we're going to see, um, or kind of take, take a tour down a little bit lower. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a, a clue for that mystery sea creature. So your first clue kind of relates to our barnacle. Like the barnacle, our mystery creature has a trap door 
to keep it safe from predators. It can close up and hopefully not get eaten by a big red rock crab. So that is the first clue that I have for you. Um, and now let's let's move on through our intertidal zone to kind of that mid intertidal zone. Wow. Oh, sorry. We're doing three things at once here. All right. So let's get a thumbs up if you can see. There's some things crawling around in this little in this little tank here. Awesome. So I see things like a mud snail. These um, will also be found in the high intertidal zone because, again, they have a hard shell that's going to help them survive being uncovered in the water for so long. I also see oh, there's some crabs. Now, these are really fun animals to find when you flip over a rock. Um, they go scuttling under rocks to stay nice and cool and escape the heat of the sun. Now, something that's neat about all crab species is I can flip a crab over very carefully because this one does have rather large pinchers for a little green shore crab. Now I can see that on its belly there's a distinct flap and that flap can either be skinny and pointy kind of like a necktie and that will indicate that we have a male. So we like to say guys wear ties and if I compare it to a female crab you'll notice her belly is from leg it extends from leg to leg. It's a big, kind of like a basket. And that's helpful because she can hold all of her eggs underneath that belly flap and let them hatch into the water where they'll be, uh oh, I'm trying to get, it's trying to pinch me. Uh, and those eggs will be a little microscopic baby crab until it settles into a new one. Now these guys only get about an inch and across half that shell. Um, and so they stay pretty small. But in order to get bigger, what's kind of interesting for all crabs is that hard exoskeleton, they have to shed. They have to lose that shell so that they can grow a bigger new shell. So I have this little crab in my hand and it looks, it looks like it's dead. But I will tell you, it's actually just a crab molt. And what happened is this little crab unzipped its shell so that its entire body could come out. It took its claws, it took its little walking legs, its eyeballs, everything came out of that little crab and it left this hard shell behind and filled up its body with as much water as it could hold and then that hard um, shell would form on this brand new little crab here. So kind of cool to see if you can identify when you're at the beach whether a crab that you think is dead is indeed possibly a molt instead. Now what's neat about crabs is that ability to tell whether it's a boy or a girl can help us protect these crab species. A lot of times if you're catching crabs to eat, because they are delicious in butter, can I can I see a, some hand raise? <laughs> raise your hand if you've eaten a crab before? So be awesome. They're, they're pretty delicious. But if I ate all the boys and all the girls, I could have a problem. There might not be enough crabs to make more crabs. And so we want to make sure that crabs are harvested in a way that ensures there's more crabs um, for days on end. And so another thing that I see in this tank are these hermit crabs. Um, and they're going to lead us to our next clue. Um, We'll give them a second to kind of relax and walk out of their shells. Um, this is a good reminder to leave those shells on the beach because these hermit crabs need bigger and bigger shells as they grow. Um, they need to be able to move into those shells. So uh, you can see a little hermit crab pile here. A good reason to leave those shells on the beach. Okay, so we're gonna swap back over to me. And I have a big crab here. Now, I'm gonna, I have a pop, a pop quiz question. 
because you can see this belly flap is much larger. So I want you to hold up the number one <coughs> if you think that this is a boy crab, or a number two if you think you can identify this as a girl crab. So let's see. One for boys? Oh, I don't know. Two for I girls? about half and half. Half and half. 50 50 makes sense. If you have a two, you're correct. This big wide belly flap reminds us that this is a female crab. And this one, you can actually, whoa! Ah. I will tell you, my goodness, this is the crabbiest of all the crabs. They get much bigger than this. They can actually get about a dollar bill across the back. And you can see this lady, she's, she's trying to pinch me, which uh, must mean she's a very crabby crab. Uh, when they get full grown, those pinchers are strong enough to actually break a pencil in half, which uh, I'm thankful I, I'm not getting my fingers in there. Uh, these pinchers are for protection, but lucky for me, she can't reach right where my, my little delicate hands are. So, phew, I'm safe. But this red rock crab can eat, the, eat our mystery creature um, by breaking apart that shell with these powerful pinchers. And then that shell can be used for animals like those hermit crabs um, as a new home. So that's our next clue is that our mystery creature gets eaten by re red rock crabs, but then that empty shell can be used by another animal. So I think now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to the classrooms and we'll see if we have any questions from you all. That sounds great. Let's start with... My, I might just keep holding this crab and um, maybe you can hear it. It's kind of making a clicking bubbly sound. Can I get a thumbs up if you can hear that crab? What? Maybe pinches the microphone? I, I think I've got Mrs. <laughs> Allison's class. Do they have a question? Okay, perfect. Yes, they do. Here we go. Why awesome! Is it, why is it named Penrose State Park? Why is it named oh. Penrose State Park? That is a really, really good question. Um, part of the, the longer name is Penrose Point State Park. And so I know part of it is because as the tide goes out, there's actually a huge sand spit that's exposed. Um, we might be able to, I don't know if you saw the video uh, that we sent your way, but you can see this huge sand spit that creates a big point. Oh yeah, good thumbs up. Um, and so part of that name comes from that, but I'm going to have to do some research or ask, ask the rangers some questions about where that name Penrose comes from. Great question. How about uh, Mrs. Till? Wells class in Stillwater's class in uh, Yakima. Okay. Me? Yep. Nice and loud. Well, why are we learning about this? Yeah. Oh, well. So, this is actually, that's, I think, a really good question. Why are we learning about these creatures that live on the beach? Well, one reason is that if I know about the animals that call the Puget Sound home, I'm more likely to care about the Puget Sound. It's not just a bunch of water and sand. There's actually really incredible things that need to be protected. And so if I know about it, I can care about it. And hopefully my, my job is to help inspire stewardship so you can care about it too. And I hope that someday you get to maybe come visit Penrose Point State Park or another beach um, or any wild place and you can think kind of along those same lines. So, awesome question. Thanks for asking that. How about Mrs. Phillips' class? Oh, uh, we don't have a question. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Uh, Annie. Yes. Annie, nice and loud. Yes. Um, yeah. Jackson, sit down on the bottom. My question is... Can you guys hear us okay? Are you asking, is the male crab bigger than the female crab? I think I heard you. Yeah. If that yeah. is what you just asked. Is the male crab girl bigger than the female crab? Um, in some crab species, that's true. Uh, occasionally you will see bigger females um, than the males, but at least for this red rock crab species, um, I noticed that the males, their big pinchers get a lot larger 
um, whereas the females have still really big pinchers, but they're just not quite as uh, muscular as those as those guys are. We had a question on the chat about um, male crabs pinchers. Are they bigger than? Those? Yeah. So the um, so male crabs pinchers can be bigger in at least the red rock species. I know for sure. Great, Great. question. How about um, Miss Crance's class? Right. Do we have a question? Guys, speak up though. Stacia. How many species approximately are there of ocean animals in the Puget Sound? Oh my gosh. That's a tough question. I would not be able to count them on my hand or my toes. Hmm. I'm gonna, I'd have to look that up. There are a lot of different species, because I can think of at least five different species of barnacles, which is just barely skimming the top. Um, I will tell you that there are so many more animals than we have time to talk about today. Uh, so that's a great question. And I think a good curiosity, because you might, you might do some research and learn about some really amazing animals that we won't be able to cover today, but that you might learn about on your own. We have another one from the chat. Is there a reason that the crabs are red? Oh, so believe it or not, this red is actually a great color for camouflage. You would think red would be really flashy, something that you could see really easily. And it is when the tide goes out. We see this bright red crab back and we're like, oh, let's check out that red rock crab. But as the light filters through the water, red is the first wavelength to disappear. And so a red shell actually is great camouflage when these animals are underwater because it just kind of turns a brown color and you wouldn't actually be able to see this crab unless it started moving around. So, <laughs> super question. Okay, let's go on. Awesome. Is there one more class with questions or No, we... I think we got them. Okay, perfect. So I have, let's see, I gave you your clue, right? We have a trap door and the shell can be used um, if it's eaten by one of those red rock crabs uh, for habitats like a hermit crab. So let's continue. Um, we're going to go back down kind of a new part of the mid intertidal zone. Do you want the camera? And we'll, yeah, switch to the document camera. All right, so when you start seeing this seaweed, um, this is called sea lettuce. That's a really good clue that we're starting to get lower in the intertidal zone uh, because the seaweed, it uses energy from the sun, but it can't dry out. If it dries out, it will die, um, which isn't so bad because then it can be used as food for other animals. But that seaweed's a great clue that we're getting lower on the beach. And we might start finding things like this sand dollar. Um, another name for it is a sea biscuit or a sea cookie because it's got this round shape, um, kind of like a dollar coin or a cookie. And you may say, well, Stina, I've never seen a sand dollar that's black or purple like this one is. And that's because normally we see the, the just the shell of that sand dollar and it has that star pattern on top and then the hole in the bottom. When a sand dollar is alive, its body is covered with this kind of velvety layer of short spines. And those spines are actually um, kind of a good clue to know that this creature is a relative of a sea urchin, which if you imagine like a baseball covered in spikes, that would be really similar to um, a sea urchin, only a sand dollar is squished flat. So this hard shell um, is covered in these little short spines and those spines and little tiny suction cup toes can help move food into the mouth of the sand dollar. Now, I have to tell you something kind of strange about sand dollars. As the tide is going out, I don't know how they do it. I don't know, maybe maybe they use a shell phone or I don't, I don't know how it goes, but they Shh. all use the bathroom at the same time. And it's, it's well timed because the tide is going to take all that waste away. And then when the tide comes back, they can start eating again and wait, wait for the next, <laughs> the next bathroom bell with the tide. So can I get a thumbs up if you think that's pretty strange that they use the bathroom at the same time? All 
analogy. It's a weird thing. Lots of thumbs. <laughs> Lots of thumbs. I love it. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna keep exploring um, our low inner tidal. We're going to the low inner tidal zone. So I have another very very strange creature, and it is the sea anemone. Now it looks kind of like a beautiful flower, but it's a fierce predator. It has stinging tentacles. So when I actually touch these sea anemones, it feels sticky on my finger. And that's because those tentacles are actually shooting harpoon cells into my finger. Fortunately, it doesn't hurt because my hand is too tough to feel those stinging tentacles. But if I was a tiny little shrimp or a tiny crab or fish and I got caught in those tentacles, that sea anemone could gobble me right up. Now, that's not the strangest thing. Another weird thing about this sea anemone is that if those tentacles weren't able to catch any food, it's all good. There is a layer of algae, kind of like seaweed, underneath the skin of this anemone's body. And that algae can use the energy from the sun to photosynthesize and create sugars that can feed the anemone. And then that anemone provides a safe place for that algae to live. And this is what we call a symbiotic relationship that's commensal. It's good for both parties involved, right? Good for the algae because it has a place to live. Good for the anemone because it gets some food out of the deal. Um, Stina, we had a question Ooh. in chat that I just noticed. It's about sand dollars. Oh, Why I have are the sand, sand dollars question. formed as circles? That's from um, Mrs. Miss Krantz's class. That is, I don't know why they're formed as circles, but I know that circle makes it really easy for them to move in any direction. Sometimes they can scuttle to the left, sometimes they can scuttle to the right. Um, and so they don't really have necessarily a front or a back to lead them. So that circle is just a nice adaptation for our, again, nice little sand dollar. Here. Sorry, I just need no, to get that. No, that's good. Get our, get our chat question answered too. I really appreciate that you're, <clears throat> you're joining us through through that method. It's actually okay. for on classes. Now are we ready for the weirdest thing about these sea anemones? Can I get a thumbs up if you're ready to be weirded out? I want to make sure you're prepared for this strange, strange thing. Okay, here's the deal. Our sea anemones, to reproduce, split themselves in half. And one anemone can become two, and two can become four, and four can become eight, and so on. And you can have colonies of all these little anemone clones. So one individual can be hundreds of individuals. It's amazing. And at this point, it's time to compete for space because space in the intertidal zone is a limited a limited thing and so this one cl uh, individual clone might think like hey this is a nice rock i'm gonna take over this rock so i'm gonna turn over to our classrooms and i want to know how do you think these sea anemones battle each other how do they fight and take over the rock of another individual clone of see anemones here. Let's go to... Let's start with Miss Phillips' class. Miss Phillips' class. Do you have a good guess for us? All these sea anemones. Lisa! Oh, my God. Jesus. Basically, I guess. You can just talk from there. Um, so, Lisa, do you think they like, maybe they like, sting each uh, the singing tentacles? That, I think, is a wonderful guess, because you would think, right, I have sting tentacles, you have stinging tentacles, we could just sting each other, but the clones live very close together and the waves can make them touch. And if we were stinging our own clones of each other, that would be problematic. So thankfully, the aggregating sea anemone is immune to the sting of itself and of other individuals. So, great guess. Let's go to Mrs. It's even weirder. Let's go to Mrs. Krantz's class, Mrs. Krantz's How about class. Mrs. Krantz's class? Can we get a, a guess from one of your students? Is that a question? What's your idea? Why do you think it's fine? Speak up. It's possible that they can send out poison like bees do or some other animals in order to fly over space or use their natural defense mechanisms to do so and fight. Like most animals. Absolutely on the right track. So 
Um, it's not exactly poison that they use. It is instead their digestive fighting guts. They will shoot guts out of the side of their wall and they will digest each other. Now, let's say the bigger an enemy wins and it digests one of the clones, but then, oh my gosh, it's surrounded by 10 clones of the other individual. It gets digested back and they go through this digesting war back and forth, back and forth until they decide, okay, it's, it's not worth it. We're gonna just, we'll have this side of the rock, you can have that side of the rock, but they're constantly kind of battling over this line that we like to call the no anemone zone. So if you ever get a chance to go to the beach and you see a rock covered in these aggregating anemones, look for the spot where the anemones aren't touching each other. And that might indicate that there's one clone individual on one side and another set of clones on the other side. Can I get a thumbs up if you think that's so weird that it's cool? Awesome. Okay, we're going to swap uh, cameras and we're going to meet another low tide creature. tidal zone um, because they're not able to handle a lot of time out of the water they they don't have a hard shell like a barnacle would need to, to stay dry for a really long period of time so an animal like this sea star here everybody wave to the sea star hello um, it, it can only survive um, for a couple of hours out of the water which is why we find it on only really low tides. Now I have to tell you, this animal has also some really incredible weird adaptations. Um, one is that it has eyes. Can I, can I get a guess? Can you show me on your hand how many eyes do you think the sea star has? Maybe, maybe it's a trick question. Maybe there's zero. Hmm. Ooh. I'm seeing five. I'm seeing, I'm seeing actually a lot of the correct answer. If you have five fingers raised, that's correct. Because there is an eye on every tip of the sea star's arms. Pretty wild. Now, they can't see like us. Um, it's more of kind of a light dark sensor. Uh, and that can help them navigate and stay in that nice low intertidal zone as the water is going out and it gets lighter. They can move with that tide. Now, because they uh, don't have any bones, they don't have a brain, and they don't have blood, um, one thing about this animal is instead of blood, it actually pumps seawater into its body. So when the water goes out, it can't move. It's just stuck there. Now when the water comes in, that allows it to power its little hydraulic tube feet. And it moves very slowly across, or maybe holds onto a rock if a predator comes. If a predator does get a hold of an arm, they can liquefy their connective tissues and let that arm go. Kind of like a lizard can lose its tail. And then it has the ability to actually grow its arm back with the eye included. Amazing. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. So our sea star, uh, because of uh, that, uh, it's, it's not a very tasty animal. It doesn't have a lot of stuff inside of it. it it's a top predator. Um, this guy is actually responsible for keeping our ecosystem in balance because it can eat away things like, oh, I don't know where mussels went, like these mussels. These are related to a clam. They're a two-shelled creature that sticks on the rocks. And they take up a lot of space. So the sea star can crawl over and eat some of those mussels to make space for the barnacles and the sea anemones and other animals that might be living in that area. Now I have to tell you, we have another strange thing. This sea star eats in a really weird way. Instead of, like us, taking its food, putting it in its mouth, chewing it up and swallowing to digest and enjoy, the sea star actually spits its stomach out of its mouth, which is located on the underside in the center. It's a four-chambered sac that surrounds its food. Digest, digest, digest. And then it puts that stomach back inside and can crawl on to its next unsuspecting victim. Raise your hand if you wish 
you could eat like a sea star. Oh my gosh. There's a few takers. <laughs> Your cafeteria would be, oh, everybody, bleh. I'm, I'm not coming over if you, if you all make that transition. Sorry about that. <laughs> But, but I like, I like your style. So, this is our, uh, really fun find down in that low inner tidal zone. Um, and sometimes next to it, we find what's going to be our third clue, which is that our mystery creature, its eggs can be mistaken for trash. So these are the eggs of our mystery creature. And, oh, let me... <laughs> Um, and they are covered in kind of a slime layer of sand and mucus, um, and the eggs are found in between, and there can be half a million in a nice big egg collar like this. So, uh, before we get to revealing that mystery creature and guessing what it is, I want to know if we have any questions about that low inner tidal zone. Let's go to Mrs. Allison's class. Questions, guys? How many moon snails do you find per year? Oh, um, let's let's get back to that question uh, a little later. I think there's some cheating. <laughs> there's going a on. lot of them <laughs> out out at Penrose. Okay, Miss Krantz's class. Miss Krantz's class. Oh. Hi, you want to ask yours? Yeah. Speak up. Okay. What rate do starfish move at? Ooh, ready? I'm gonna show you. They move pretty slow. <laughs> Not quite glacier speed, um, but uh, the fastest sea star is actually um, found here in the Puget Sound, and it's a sea star that has about 23 legs, which means it also has 23 eyes, and they can move about three feet a minute, which isn't very fast. <laughs> um, but being that they eat a lot of things that are just stuck to rocks, um, that can't move fast at all, or move at all, um, that predator doesn't have to be very fast to be good at catching things that it wants to eat. So, great question. Thanks for that. Let's go to Miss Phillips' class. Perfect. Miss Phillips' class, do you have a question for us? Yes. Dre? Uh, uh, how much do starfish eat? Oh. How much how much starfish are in um, this ocean? Ooh, so, um, I don't, I can't think of the number off the top of my head of how many sea star species, or starfish, um, we kind of like to call them sea stars because since it's an animal that doesn't have a brain, no bones, no blood, it's not really like a fish. Um, so we, we call it a sea star, but I, I know what you're saying with that. But, uh, here in the Puget Sound there's over 20 different species. Um, and you only saw one of them today, so you'll you'll definitely have to come visit us and see see if you can find uh, more different types of sea stars that call the Puget Sound home. Great question. Okay, that was all. That's everybody. Perfect. Okay, so now that we've gotten questions from everybody, I think it's it's time. Do we have a guess for that mystery sea creature? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to back up just a little bit, Stina. Yeah. Um, and we do have Miss Kranz's classes on. Oh, Ian, okay. But a, they're also asking a couple a questions. Question. Um, do starfish bite, and does a starfish have multiple hearts? Ooh, I do. Does a starfish bite, and does it have multiple hearts? I don't think it has any hearts. No hearts. It's not like the octopus that has three hearts. Amazing. Um, and they don't bite because um, they just have that stomach, that uh, those tube feet open up the shell of the thing they're eating and then they spit their stomach out. So no biting teeth or anything to worry about there. Fun question. Okay. Very good. Okay. Now let's okay. go to guesses. Now are we ready for guesses? Let's go. Uh, Drum roll. Which class are we going to for the uh, first let's guess? Let's start with Miss Phillips class. Okay. Miss Phillips class. What do you think our mystery creature is that... Its shell can be used for other creatures. It has a trap door to keep it safe. And people mistake eggs and trash. Okay, I'm going to use our popsicle stick. It's nice and fair and random. Let's see. Lisa. 
is it like a sea? Is it a sea snail? Sea snail? It is a species of sea snail. You're on the right track. Um, I have a feeling we have a group that might know what type of sea snail it is. Let's go to Miss Crance's class. Miss Crance's class. Do you know what what type of snail our mystery creature is? Speak up. Is it a sea snail with a spike shell? Ooh, the shell is is round and circular like the moon. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Allison's class, let's go to you. Okay, Mrs. Allison's class, let's go. snail to share with you. Let me let me grab it out of our our tank here. Okay. Check out this huge slimy ew. snail. It uses this big slimy foot like oh um, look look at that. Look at that slime dangling there. Oh it's like it's like someone sneezed on our moon snail. But no, it's just it's just the slime. Which helps it slither through the mud and find its favorite food, which might be a big juicy clam. Now clams have muscles that hold their shell together, so either this moon snail can surround that clam and suffocate it, or it has a tongue that's like a chainsaw, and this radula can lick through the base of that clam shell creating a hole which then damages the muscle that holds that clam so tightly shut. And then voila, it's bon appetit for this big slimy snail. And they only eat a clam about every every four days because I think it, it takes them a long time to, to eat that clam anyways. So um, <laughs> you can just see that this big slimy creature um, is quite the predator, which sometimes people think Oh my gosh, I'm so mad at the moon snails because they're out there eating all the clams that I want to eat. And so, while they may think it's a good idea to get rid of this slimy, slimy snail, remember those eggs? These half a million little baby moon snails are actually food for the clams. So the presence of a moon snail is actually good news for those clams that we like to eat. So, um, it's all part of that circle of life. And the moon snails are definitely important, even though they might eat a clam here and there. Now, I have to show you a pretty cool thing about this moon snail, because it can actually fit this entire foot in this shell. Now, let me grab a smaller one for you. Oh, do moon snails have eyes? Um, they don't have eyes, but they do have little sensory antennas, which I don't know if I can can see them on either side before I pretend to eat our, our moon snail here. So if, remember that red rock crab we met earlier? If a red rock crab comes across a delicious looking moon snail, it will try and eat it. Now I'm going to pretend to eat this moon snail, not by taking a bite of it, but simply teasing it and you'll see all of that water gets squeezed out of the foot kind of like a sponge and that entire foot fits inside this round little shell, um, which you can see there. Now when that foot's closed up, like all snail species, it has that trap door, which kind of has rings like a tree, so we can guess how old that moon snail is based on those rings, and hopefully that trap door will be enough to keep that hungry red rock crab out, and that moon snail can live another day. But red rock crab's got to eat too, so uh, occasionally we'll find shells of that moon snail that are broken on the edge um, and they likely got they got eaten so um there you have it that is our mystery creature here so i wonder if we have any questions about the fantastic moon snail Ooh, let's find out how about miss <laughs> I, have to, I have to wipe all that slime off my hands oh my goodness how about miss grant's class miss grant's class Okay, so since the moon snail has no eyes, when it's in the uh, sea or ocean, 
um, since there's a lot of noises in there, how does it like track its food? Ooh, so um, those little antennas, they can, they kind of work like smell does. And so they can sense, you know, where the clam is and then that foot can feel, oh, I've got a live clam here and I'm going to eat it up. So um, they might, they kind of that chemical sensing in the water is um, how a lot of creatures um, in the Puget Sound uh, can help find their Great. Great question. How, how about Miss Class? Uh, Jack? Phillips class. Um, well, how come there's so much slime on the Winsdale? <laughs> I don't know, but there's like almost too much slime for me to handle. You should, you should see this tank in here. It looks like there's just globs of snot, but um, that's how it slides through the mud. I think it helps reduce the friction and lets it dig deep to find those delicious clams. Um, it's one of those adaptations that might seem strange to us, but without that slime, that moon snail couldn't move around or lay its eggs, so it's got to be slimy. How hard is a moon snail's shell? Ooh, how hard is a moon snail's shell? Um, it's like, it's pretty hard. They're a solid, solid thing here. Um, it's like a rock, really. Uh, really similar to a clam shell. Mm -hmm. Nice cool. question. Um, how about Mrs. Allison's class? Um, it's not about a moon snail, but it's, um, what is the most unique looking animal you've seen there? Ooh, good question. That is a great question. I think one thing that's really uh, unique to find when you're out on the beach are animals called sea slugs. So it's kind of like a moon snail, but it's an animal with no shell. They're related. Um, and the sea slugs we find here in the Puget Sound are beautiful. They have bright colors. They have frills on their back, sometimes a little uh, butt poof for their gills. And they come like in yellows and greens and oranges. And they're just the most fabulous colors. And um, they're only found in really, really, really low tides because um, they're really not good at surviving out of the water, and so um, those delicate animals are just really fun to find. I'd encourage you to maybe do a little bit of research on, on sea slugs, and I think you'll be amazed and kind of disappointed that our land slugs aren't as cool. <laughs> okay, that's all the classes. All right, so that is all of our classes. Um, with that, <laughs> congratulations on identifying our mystery sea creature. I hope that you enjoyed learning and having fun with Harbor Wild Watch here today. We are so excited that you could join us at the beach and learn a little bit about the animals' adaptations that live here in the intertidal zone, as well as about why caring for them can help us protect these amazing state parks and all of our natural spaces. So I'm going to invite Kathleen on over and she's going to close it out for us. Hi, boys and girls. Thanks so much for joining us at beautiful Penrose Point State Park. And thanks, Tina. That was so fun. It, I watched that with the moon snail, you know, every, every class period, and it's still really fascinating. So thanks so much for coming, and thanks to the Washington State Parks Foundation, the Peach Foundation, GCI, Polycom, and Vision Net, who are our great partners, and Harbor Wild Watch. If you have more questions for Stina, I know you can email her at stina at harborwildwatch.org. Yeah. So thanks, everybody. Have a good day.